Caroline Modaresi Tirani, you're watching HuffPost Live. Maryland Congressman John Sarbanes doesn't believe politics in America should be driven by the wealthy or by money from special interest groups, but in reality it is. When it comes to money in politics, the richest 0.01% of Americans make up nearly 42% of all campaign funding. That's according to CrowdPak data from the 2012 election cycle. Well, to flip the script, Congressman Sarbanes has proposed the Government by the People Act that would use public financing in political campaigns and put the focus more on small donors. Well, joining me now to discuss how he hopes to change the influence of money in politics is Congressman Sarbanes. So thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you very much, Caroline. It's great to be here. Great to have you with us. So talk to us a little bit about uh, your bill. We know that there are three key parts. So everyone gets $25 to donate to candidates, six to one matching funds, at least for small donors' help for candidates facing an onslaught of super PAC money uh, and dark money. And uh, at the $25, we've got to ask you, so where does that come from? So what we would do is we would give every American a tax credit of up to $25 in each of the two years of an election cycle. And that makes it easier for them to step up and participate on the funding side of campaigns. If we're trying to build a new system where America lives, where everyday citizens live that can sort of underwrite campaigns so candidates and members of Congress don't have to chase the PACs and the big money donors and the special interests, you got to find a way to bring those small donors in because they're the leverage in the system. And what the tax credit does is it makes it easier for them to do that. It's a refundable tax credit. So now the $50 donor who wants to get in there and support a grassroots candidate, they get $25 tax credit to help them do that. And we think that millions more Americans will be in a position to step into the game, participate on the funding side of campaigns, and in return, candidates will start paying attention to them instead of always chasing the big money. So do you think that most Americans are put off today by actually getting involved monetarily in campaigns because of the current system? I think when they look at the super PACs and the billionaire investments in Keynes, they're definitely turned off of politics. The metaphor I use, Caroline, is that a lot of decent Americans who we need to be part of the political process, they've fled the political town square. They've kind of packed up their things and gone home because they feel like the system is rigged, and so why should they participate in it? But if you can make them believe that their voice actually matters and that making a $25 donation will actually get some attention from the candidates so that their priorities count for something, then I think they will come back into the town square. They will decide, I'm important, uh, my voice is consequential, and they'll step back into the ring. But right now, they're very cynical. They're almost desperately cynical at this point. I can't blame them when you look at the way the system is run. So we have to build a different system that's built for everyday citizens, for the folks that feel pushed to the sidelines of their own democracy. If we do that, we can get government back working for the people instead of working for the special interests. Well, I mean, talk to us a little bit more about the idea of special interest groups. Uh, do you feel that special right. interest groups at the moment are actually taking over uh, the American political system, that they are really in the driving seat when it comes to politics in America today? Well, let me, may, let me be clear. There's special interests and then there's special interests with money, right? And what's happened is, I mean, everybody has a special interest. You can be a nonprofit organization. You want to come in, you want to talk to your member of Congress about some housing issue that's important or a gun safety issue. But you don't have a lot of money as an organization. You, you can't stand up a political uh, action committee. So the question becomes, uh, can you get access? Can you get the attention of a member of Congress? The problem is that we have a lot of special interests, Wall Street, the oil and gas industry, big ag, the list goes on, who can also afford to put a lot of money uh, behind their advocacy. And since candidates and members of Congress need a lot of money to run campaigns these days, they become very susceptible to the preferred access dynamic that these special interests are looking for. So it's, it's special interests with money that are the problem. They're getting all the attention. Uh, their priorities are the ones that dominate our public policy in Washington. And it's because 
They're the ones that can afford to underwrite campaigns. That's why we need to build a system that will allow candidates to go somewhere else where America lives, raise money there, be competitive by having everyday citizens and public matching funds underwrite their campaigns. Then when it comes time to make the public policy, they'll be accountable to the people and not accountable to the special interests that have big money. So let's talk a little bit about 2016, because 2016 candidates uh, have to report their third quarter deadline this week to reported earnings. That's from uh, July 1st to September 30th. Uh, do you wince when you hear uh, the millions and millions of dollars that are coming from special interest groups with money when it comes to fueling some of the 2016 candidates' campaigns? Absolutely, you wince, because what you realize is whichever candidate ends up winning an election, um, if you're a congressional candidate, for example, um, and a lot of your campaign funding uh, has been underwritten by special interests, then when you get to Washington, uh, they're going to call the shots. And this is human nature. I'm not saying that most members of Congress um, are in some kind of quid pro quo situation uh, where they feel like they should do the beck and call of a particular funder. But the fact of the matter is, if, if in order to survive in politics, in order to win your election, uh, you need to raise money and the place to get it is from some special interest group or political action committee, then when it comes time for you to make the policy, you're going to lean in that direction. And if you aggregate that impact on all of the members of Congress, then you've got an institution which is leaning towards the special interests towards Wall Street, uh, towards these big industries, and leaning away from the public. This is why the public is so angry. This is why they look at Washington, feel the system is rigged, and have decided to wash their hands of it. And our challenge, and this is what we try to do with the Government by the People Act, we have to design solutions that are practical, that are real, that put everyday citizens at the center of the equation, and put them in, put those solutions in front of this angry public and say, here's where you can channel your anger and frustration into something productive that will give you your democracy back. That's really the premise of the, Demo of the Government by the People Act. So when you say, you know, that you want a candidate or you'd, or you'd hope that there would be a candidate that would put the American people first and put the American people at the sort of center of any kind of campaign. When you look at the Democratic field, uh, who do you think is actually doing that adequately? Do you think that Hillary Clinton is? Do you think that Bernie Sanders is? I think all of the candidates recognize that they have to speak to this sense of frustration that the voters are feeling and, you know, all, certainly all of the Democratic candidates and, and, frankly, some of the Republican candidates as well understand that cynicism and they're trying to uh, address it. Uh, Hillary Clinton recently added to her, the sort of democracy pillar of her policy platform an endorsement of small donor matching to underwrite uh, congressional campaigns and federal campaigns, which I think is a recognition that you have to create some empowerment opportunity for the average citizen out there who right now feels totally left out. So I think candidates, are certainly on the Democratic side, recognize that there's this deep uh, and intense sentiment out there in the body politic that Washington is basically captured by big money and special interests, and that that has to be addressed. Certainly Bernie Sanders has done it as he's gone out um, on the hustings uh, and others. And as the 2016 cycle um, evolves, I think you're going to see more attention to that. Because if that message is not in front of the voters, they're going to stay home. Their anger is going to end up misplaced. It's going to go towards demagogues and, and those who would kind of cynically manipulate that sentiment instead of in the direction of constructive solutions, which is where we want to channel it. And so we're certainly working hard to put the Government by the People Act out there into the presidential discussion as something that people can point to that's real reform that puts everyday citizens at the center. Well, you know, let's let's talk a little bit more about everyday citizens at the center. Uh, we've got a video question coming from uh, Jessica Mason Piatclo. Take a listen to this. 
Dark money has been used to promote and pass a host of uh, restrictions on abortion and other re reproductive rights related health care, in addition to influencing the process of judicial elections and selections. How would your proposals help curb this? Well, it's a great question when you're talking about dark money, and that's sort of the shorthand reference to these outside groups that are pouring millions of dollars in the so-called independent expenditures, and they can find an issue like the one that the, um, that the caller describes and get, and get behind that. There's a number of different ways you can address that. Number one, um, there should be more transparency and disclosure, and I support the Disclose Act in Congress, uh, which would require uh, these donors to basically indicate who they are, where their money comes from. So at least the public is in a position uh, to make some judgments. But the other thing is, and it gets back to this question of, you know, who do the candidates depend on? If we can create a system where candidates are more dependent on the people and on public financing to get elected, to run competitive campaigns, uh, then when they get in office and a public policy issue comes before them, like reproductive rights or choice, um, they're going to be able to stick with their convictions because the only people they owe are the broad public. They're not indebted, indebted to any particular well-heeled special interest group. And I think that's important. At the end of the day, we can disagree on issues, but the number one thing from a democratic standpoint is that people feel like their voices are being heard, that they can come into the marketplace of ideas, they can participate in a pluralistic democratic society, and from that you get the kind of constructive compromise that's at the heart of good sound public policy. And we've moved away from it precisely because money has gummed up the system. If you lift up the hood on the American political system and on the government right now, and you look under the hood at the machinery, it's all gummed up. The gears aren't working anymore because money has taken over. And we've got to address that situation. We're not going to get back to a place where we create public policy that earns the respect and the support of the broad public out there. You know, when you say it sort of gummed up the system, do you, obviously it's been emboldened by the Citizens United Act, you know, the, the Supreme Court ruling on Citizens United, and that was shrouded and wrapped around this idea of a First Amendment right. Uh, do you think that it is a First Amendment right, that it is a First Amendment issue when we're talking about this kind of money in politics, or do you think that that's sort of been hijacked, if you will, uh, by people who have a vested interest in making sure that there is a steady stream of big money flowing into politics? Look, I'm a defender of the First Amendment. I think most Americans are. But I think this court, the Roberts Court, um, has taken their interpretation of the First Amendment in this arena of political speech way too far. Um, and that's why, you know, we're trying to push back on the Citizens United case. That's why you have um, those efforts. Uh, but frankly, the, the legislation I'm proposing and the remedy that I'm proposing, which is an empowerment model for small donors and everyday citizens, it doesn't get tangled up in the First Amendment. Because if you think of it, Caroline, we're not proposing with our approach to actually put limits on anybody's speech. We're trying to add speech for people who don't have it. I mean, if you're a, if you're a $25 donor out there, you don't feel like you have speech that you can be heard, that your voice is consequential, because no candidate is going to pay attention to you for that kind of a contribution. But if the candidate can earn a six to one match of public dollars, which is what our bill provides, then all of a sudden the $50 donor is worth $350. It, amplify, it amplifies the voice of the small donor so that they can be heard again. So we're about giving speech to people who have no speech anymore in this world where money is speech, and, and having those folks compete for the attention of candidates with these well-heeled, deep-pocketed donors out there that right now command all the attention. So we want to build a system that competes with the big money crowd and gets the attention of the candidates and members of Congress and the institution. So again, when it comes time to vote on important issues, it's that group that the candidate and the member will have in mind, not some special interest lobbyist who's trying to come into their office. 
Well, I want to read an excerpt from former Ohio Secretary of State candidate Nina Turner, who recently spoke to Demos about the influence of money in politics. And she highlighted how difficult it is for women of color to raise money for office. This is what she said. People of color have to overcome so many more barriers in terms of people seeing our viability. Whether or not people believe in our ability to serve, our ability to be able to do this and to make this happen. There are only two African-American women elected statewide in the entire United States of America. Uh, talk to me a little bit, Congress Congressman. Do you believe that the current system does hinder chances for minority candidates in particular? There's absolutely no question about this. Minority candidates, women candidates, candidates who don't know a lot of people with a lot of money are being filtered out of our system, which is, which is outrageous because they're going to be the best representatives, the best advocates often for the communities that they seek to represent. But what happens is we talk about the green primary or the money primary, which is sort of the winnowing that happens before someone even puts their name into the ring as a candidate. If you don't believe you can raise sufficient dollars, particularly at the congressional level, to compete effectively, you're not going to get into the race because you got no chance. If you got to raise a million dollars or a million and a half dollars, which is the average cost to run a winning congressional campaign these days, if you don't know a lot of people with a lot of money, forget about it you got no chance. With public financing, if you go around and you collect small donations and you can earn matching dollars that come in and support your candidacy, all of a sudden, if you know how to knock on doors and make phone calls and work the crowd and get them excited about your candidacy, at the same time you're doing that, you're raising dollars that can make you competitive. And you're seeing this actually at the state level. You're seeing it in places like Maine and Arizona and Connecticut, where public financing systems are bringing a whole new group of candidates into the mix, people who are running for the first time because they, they can be competitive financially with the public funding. They're running, they're competing, and they're winning. In Connecticut, after they put public financing in place, the number of women and minority candidates who were running successfully there increased by 30 percent. So this is all about not just getting the voters uh, to be more invested in their democracy again. It's, it's being able to pull from the great voter pool people who want to also become candidates and get in there and run and represent their communities. And there will be much more diversity. You also need buy-in, don't you, from uh, you know both sides of the political aisle. You mentioned that not just Democrats, but also some Republicans starting to twitch a little right. bit more uh, about this issue. Uh, given how fractious things have been uh, uh, between uh, the Republicans and the Democrats, and of course, given the exit now of Speaker John Boehner, uh, do you imagine, do you hope, and do you envisage that this is going to be a uh, strong bipartisan issue that you know both sides will be willing to work on together to push through? This has come out of the Democratic corner, but I think the potential to build bipartisan uh, support for this kind of reform is strong. And the, and the reasons are these. Number one, as I said, uh, we're not in that, in the sort of First Amendment sandbox. So we're not in this tussle with the conservatives over the First Amendment and restraining the First Amendment. We're talking about adding speech. So we, we eliminate that, that sort of point of, of dispute or confrontation there. Secondly, um, when you look at polling data, it shows that Republicans, independents, and Democrats all support an empowerment approach to reform of money in politics. They want to be in the mix. They want to feel like their voice matters. And if you think about it, Caroline, the uh, Occupy movement on the left and the Tea Party movement on the right in their purest forms come from the same place. They come from the same feeling, which is that there's some shadowy elite of powerful forces in New York and Washington that are running the country, and everybody else is being left behind. And so if we can capture and channel this energy and this anger and frustration that's coming from both sides of the aisle and the political spectrum and begin to focus it towards a practical solution, that gives people their voice back. Again, it's not going to say they're all going to agree with each other, 
but they're going to come back into the marketplace and have a debate back into the town square and have that conversation among them. And that's the most healthy thing you could have for American democracy. Instead of a situation where a lot of folks have fled the town square, extreme elements rush in, they dominate the conversation, that turns people off even more. We've got to bring people back in. And I think Republicans and Democrats um, are ready to do that. This kind of reform gives them that opportunity. The polling data supports it. You're starting to see groups coming on the right, in addition to the left, who are pushing for this kind of solution. So I'm hopeful. I'm not naive. It's not like tomorrow we're all going to be holding hands around small donor matching systems. But I think if, if, as we continue to use the same vocabulary and the same narrative to describe the problem and then channel towards a solution, I think there are good prospects for bipartisan cooperation. Well, Congressman Sarbanes, I want to thank you so much for joining us today on HuffPost Live. Pleasure. Thank you very much. Take care. And guys, for more information on Congressman Sarbanes' work, you can check out the links in our resource well below. Stick around. Zerlina Maxwell is up next. <laughs>